Good morning, everyone, um, those here present and those who are following the proceedings online. This is the 17th hearing of our 185th regular session. Um, and it is, I'm sorry, I cannot see clearly. It is entitled Forced Climatic Displacement of Indigenous Communities in the United States. And we have representing the uh, civil society here, the following people. Vanessa? Chair Commissioner, it's, we have on civil society, Miriam Jordan from Earth Rights International, Elder Chief Shirel Parfait Dardar, from the Grand Cayu Dulag Band of Biloxi Chitmaka Choctaw Tribe Chairman, and Donald Dardar from the Pon Ocean Indian Tribe, Chief Albert White Buffalo Naki from the Jean Charles Choctaw Nation, and Patty Ferguson Bon from the Indian Legal Clinic at Arizona State University and the Pon Ocean Indian Tribe. And the representatives of the state here present are Thomas Hastings, Interim Permanent Representative of the United States Mission to the OAS, and Jackie Galigos, Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, um, U.S. Department of the Interior, and Rafael de Leon, Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator, Office of the International and Tribal Affairs, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, my name is Margaret May McCauley. I'm the second vice president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And with me are Commissioner Esmeralda Resmina de Tortino, Rapporteur for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Commissioner Joel Hernandez, and Commissioner Roberta Clark, Rapporteur for the United States. Um, also present as the Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, um, yes, <laughs> Maria Claudia Polito, and also present is the Special Rapporteur on Environmental Social, no, <laughs> on Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, Soledad um, um, Garcia Monez. We are very honored to be taking part in this special hearing. And um, we hope that we will um, examine the subject matter and the intent of, of having this meeting in the time allowed. But can I just say, the purpose of this meeting is to expose the situation of forced dis displacement and other impacts faced by four indigenous communities in the state of Louisiana and one indigenous community in Alaska due to the climate crisis and the lack of action by the state to protect coastal indigenous communities from the catastrophic effects of climate change. The time we will allow for each, part, part, each of the party groups to speak is to civil society 20 minutes, to the state, 20 minutes, to us of the Inter-American Commission, 20 minutes, and then we will have a further 12 minutes of comments from civil society and comments from the states of 12 minutes, and we will, the commission will close in six minutes. The latter three branch, uh, 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 space of time would be how we use the 20, 20 minutes effectively. So with that, I invite civil society to start their submissions. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. My name is Miriam Jordan. I am the climate justice attorney at Earth Rights International. On behalf of the petitioners, I would like to thank the commission for convening this crucial hearing on the forcible displacement of indigenous tribes due to the climate crisis. And we also appreciate the participation of the U.S. government in this hearing as well. During this hearing, you will hear the testimony of leaders from coastal tribes located in Louisiana and Alaska who have faced 
loss of ancestral homelands, destruction of sacred burial sites, and the endangerment of cultural traditions, heritage, and livelihoods, essentially their way of life. In the resolution, climate emergency, scope of inter-American human rights obligations, the commission recognizes that states must take measures to slow down the negative consequences of climate change, and that states devote the maximum available resources to the adoption of measures to mitigate it. Yet here, uh, the federal government, state of Louisiana and state of Alaska have failed to do so, even though the tribes are among those most impacted by climate change. The government has promoted unchecked climate destructive oil and gas projects, failed to provide the tribes adequate resources and technical assistance for their climate adaptation and relocation plans, and even refused to acknowledge the tribes as indigenous peoples at a, on a federal and state level. As a result, we are very concerned about the tribal citizens' right to life, right to self-determination, right to free prior and informed consent, and right to cultural heritage. We appreciate the commission's attention to this urgent human rights crisis, and it is now my honor to pass the mic to Elder Chief Sherelle Parfait Dardar. Good morning, everyone, and really honored to be here with all of you today. Thank you for providing us with this opportunity to share our truth. Um, of course, I am Sherelle Parfait Dardar. I am now the elder chief of my community. We recently appointed Chief Devin Parfait, signaling a transition of leadership that has been passed down for many generations. We live in coastal Louisiana, or as we call it, down the bayou. Our community of Grand Cayu do like and our sister tribes inhabit these bayou communities. The lands once lush and fruitful have eroded away so that all that remains today are strips of land that stick out like fragile fingers on a badly wounded hand. Our communities were historically self-sustaining by trapping traditional harvesting of fish, shrimp, crab, and oysters and farming. We've maintained many of our methods of resiliency and adaptation by interacting closely with our community and being good stewards of the lands and waters through to traditional ecological knowledge. However, since our leadership and stewardship have been disregarded by those seeking wealth, the woodlands we once hunted and trapped are now underwater. The man-made canals and saltwater intrusion have depleted our estuaries and poisoned our lands. American Indians were discriminated against in the school system and weren't allowed a full education in Terrebonne Parish until 1967. This denied us from being able to participate in the society that was forming around us and threatening our way of life. Not having access to education or career training, along with declining traditional harvesting yields that provided food security and economic stability, has led us into life ways that have also caused negative consequences for our health. As we lose lands, we lose estuaries and hunting grounds, which not only sustained us for many generations, but also offered a buffer from hurricanes and flood waters. Our communities were catastrophically impacted by Hurricane Ida in 2021, as well as our fragile wetlands. I recall when my husband went out to shrimp for the first time since the storm, and he called to let me know it's going to take him a little longer to get back because he couldn't recognize where he was. Many of the challenges we face could be better addressed if our tribe was federally acknowledged, an ever-changing process we've been enduring for over 26 years. Lacking federal acknowledgement has prevented us from accessing necessary resources to assist the community with disaster response and recovery efforts and implementing solutions for climate adaptation, causing forced displacement and further jeopardizing our safety, security, and efforts to protect and preserve our continued existence. Not only are we the first peoples of this land, but we are taxpaying citizens, with many of us serving in the armed forces. However, since the arrival of the colonizers, we have endured the constant degradation and forceful stripping of our traditional self-sustaining life ways through extractive practices, subjected to discriminatory systems and processes that are overburdensome, costly, and deny us our right to self-determination. Thank you. At this time, I would like to pass it over to Chief Albert Nakia of the Jean Charles Choctaw Nation. Thank you. Okay, my name is Albert Nakin. I am the Elder Chief of Jean Charles Choctaw Nation. I serve as traditional chief for Jean Charles 
truck donation since 1996 to 2000, 2022. I lived on the Algernon Charles for 27 years and then moved a few miles away in 1975 due to flooding from Hurricane Carmen in 1974. In 2002, there was 380 tribal citizens on the island. Now only 18 lives on the island. The government has failed to recognize our sovereignty. That and, and strong hurricanes hurt our plans for protection, our people protecting our people from the impact of climate change. In 2000, the US Corps, US Corps of Engineer decided to include to, ex, to decided that including the island in the Morganza to the Gulf levee system would be too expensive. Instead, the, the levee system added 20 miles to exclude the island. We have worked since 2002 to do a tribal led resettlement with the destruction of our community following hurricanes. Our leadership reached the difficult decision to leave the island for a safe and new community. In 2014, we approached the state for support with our tribe-led resettlement. We met with the state multiple times to discuss an application to the National Disaster Resilient Competition through the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We could not apply for funds directly from the federal government because we are not federally recognized. The planning process continued for over a year with dozens of community meetings and other conversations. The most part, the most important part was that the plan included both Isle de Charles citizens who currently live on the island and those that desperado of citizens who have moved away in the early years, as myself did after Hurricane Carmen. The resettlement was a mean to reunite the tribe to ensure both citizens' safety and cultural survival. The proposal include that the island would be protected and maintained under stewardship of our ancestral territory, even if uninhabitable. Un un our resettlement area was to include a community center, museum, gathering area, childcare, healthcare, educational space, community garden, library, a seed saving program, market, safe housing for tribal citizens on the island as well as those who have already relocated. The state was awarded $48.3 million designated for the relocation we planned. The government has in, ignored our tribal leadership. Between 2018 and 2019, the state created its own plan for resettlement. It, in, it, it, it excluded the cultural pieces of our plan and required a buyout of land on the island. The state made major decision without even contacting us directly. This plan dishonor our ancestor, and in my opinion, is a result of corrupt process that have excluded us. Our tribal council has made public statement and contacted official to return to our tribe-led resettlement. The state has rejected our changes, included uh, an outright rejection of our right to make our own decision. They have claimed that we don't even have state recognition. They even denied that we led the resettlement plan to begin with. The current state website for resettlement says that the resettlement has no affiliation with any tribal or religious organization by federal law and state desire. This process is an outright denial of our self-determination we can no longer live on the island after being forced to make the decision to resettle. The barrier we face have thus far made it impossible. The state has stood in the way of us making a safe future for the Joshua Choctaw Nation. 
Thank you for listening to my complaint. I yield to Chair, Second Chair Donald Dardar. Hello, the Donald Dardar, Media, the La Pointe au Chien, the Second Chairman of the La Pointe au Chien, and the United States. I stayed, uh, you know, my name is Donald Dardar, second chairman for the Pornishan Indian tribe. And uh, I've been uh, living in Pornishan, 66 years old, and I'm planning on uh, dying there. It's just so uh, we are ex uh, exposed to a lot of land loss. As you can see my background, that, that area behind me right here was hand up years ago. Chief, could you, Chief, Chief, could you move closer to the microphone? Mm -hmm. It's a bit difficult to hear you. Thank you. Okay. My name is Donald Dordor, second chairman for the Pornishan Indian tribe. And uh, I've been living in Pornishan. I'm 66 years old and I'm planning on dying there. And uh, my, uh, my way of life is shrimping, grabbing, and oyster, and I still do that for a living. And that's our uh, way of life, and it's also our food that we eat. And uh, I've been, uh, I've been, uh, I've witnessed a lot of land loss in my in my sixty six years old, and in sixty six more years, whatever outside the levees that the building, that's not going to exist no more. We, uh, if nothing is done, and it seemed, it seemed like the state or the federal could have stepped ten years back to try and protect our community, but they know uh, they just didn't know what to do it. So this is what we got now. We're completely gonna wash away. <clears throat> and uh, I've been living on my ancestral lands for as long as we got land here. Our people have been here, and. Uh, we uh, I still plant my little garden because we got levees now behind the houses. So in the eighties, if uh, we had a salt wind, we didn't uh, we couldn't make the garden no more. So we didn't put a levee. But now we uh, we can still make a little garden and make it every year. <clears throat> and the lands that we used to trap before now we trapping for, for crab and fishing shrimp and uh, the uh, we're protecting our mounds because the oil companies have built Tarnasi. So now we gotta uh, try and protect them from eroding. So we did two shell projects so far and protect our mounds. And that's gonna help because it will be like a living shoreline so the oysters are gonna grow onto them shells that we put out. So that's gonna uh, keep growing hopefully and perform its own reach. <clears throat> and we got uh, now, we came in uh, hit, uh, shoot some uh, food doors for us to eat behind the house because uh, the salt water just keeps coming. But we gotta uh, we gotta go further north just to even kill ducks or food doors for us to eat now. So getting back. And uh medicine plants that we used to have years ago because of salt water intrusion, we you know we don't have that anymore. <clears throat> Hurricane Ida almost wiped out my community. So, Cornish are never going to be the same. We, uh, out of 80 homes, when we had 12 that was livable after Hurricane Ida last year. And it's really, uh, it's never, never going to be the same. <clears throat> you know, and if nothing's done, we will lose our way of life. You know, you know pass it on to us. And people have moved further north just to get a, a, a well because of land loss and our little community that we live in is, is uh, small, so we, we can't really put no more uh, no more uh, activities there. So we have to move further north. And then uh, now I'm gonna pass it on to the next party. Ferguson. Hi everyone, I am reading a statement on behalf of Millie Hawley, the tribal administrator for the native village of Kivalina in Alaska. 
My name is Millie Volley, and I'm the tribal administrator for the native village of Kivalina in Alaska. I've held this position for the last four years, and before that, I was president of our community for eight years. Kivalina is a community of approximately 460 Inupiaq people that sits on a barrier reef between the Chukchi Sea and the mouths of the Waluk and Kivalina rivers. It is approximately 100 miles north of the Arctic Circle and 700 miles northwest of Anchorage, Alaska. Inupiaq communities have resided in this region for thousands of years. Historically, the island where Kivalina sits have been used by our forefathers for seasonal hunting and fishing, not permanent habitation. The United States Congress authorized the building of schools in rural Alaska in 1905. Authorities built a school on the island of Kivalina and informed people in the region that we had to bring children to school or face imprisonment. The people of Kivalina noted in the very first years of the permanent settlement that this was not a safe place. As early as 1910, reports from the school committee documented that residents wished to move because of the risk of erosion. To this day, we have not been able to relocate. The climate, Congre the climate, cri the climate crisis has made erosion worse of the island and has made it dangerous to live there. In 1953, Kivalina Island was 55 acres. By 2003, a NOAA study showed that the island has shrunk to 27 acres of livable space. The climate crisis is worse in the Arctic, where the region is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the globe. Kivalina Village sits on permafrost, and as it thaws, the bank washes into the Wulik River. The thick sea ice that historically has protected the coast from the impact of storms is no longer present or freezes up later in the year, meaning that fall storms are increasingly severe and destructive. Every year we experience severe storms. They wash raw sewage into the lagoon and erode the land where we are located. In 2018, we lost so much land, we nearly lost our airstrip, which would have been very disastrous for the community because this is how we get in and out of Kivalina, especially in times of medical emergencies. It's impossible for Coast Guards to get to Kivalina in an emergency because of the landing place is limited due to shallow waters. Our city council voted to relocate in 1992. However, 30 years later, we still have been unable to relocate. The federal government has rejected our relocation sites twice, denying our self-determination, decision-making, and the wisdom of our elders. Meanwhile, we remain vulnerable to the threats of storm To date, we continue to lead our relocation planning efforts and engage in a wide range of state and federal agencies and foundations requiring complex master planning and extensive grant writing and coordination. But a lack of dedicated federal funding and state budget constraints have meant that the process moves slowly, too slowly for us who are more and more at risk with each passing year. Thank you for allowing me to read this statement on behalf of Millie Holly. And that concludes our statements from uh, civil society at this time. You are mute, Commissioner. Sorry. Yes, I now invite the state uh, representatives of the state to make their submissions. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll begin. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's public hearing. My name is Thomas Hastings. I am the interim permanent representative of the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. I'm pleased to be joined here today by Joaquin Gallegos from the Department of Interior and Rafael de Leon from the Environmental Protection Agency who will speak after my introduction. Uh, I'd like to express uh, uh, greetings to all the members of the commission 
Uh, I haven't met in person yet, but I'm relatively new. Look forward to working with you in the future. And especially to thank the uh, members of civil society who have spoken uh, and shared your concerns with us. We recognize that the United States has work to do. Our government is committed to advancing the promotion and protection of human rights of all persons. And we demonstrate that commitment through both statements and actions. The United States is also deeply committed to honoring the principles of tribal sovereignty and self-determination. The US government has a unique legal and political relationship with federally recognized Indian tribes as set forth in the Constitution of the United States, as well as in treaties, statutes, and executive orders. Indian tribes exercise inherent sovereign powers over their members and their territories. The departments and agencies of the US government are committed to strengthening government to government relationships between the United States and tribal governments. To this end, on January 26, 2021, during his very first week in office, President Biden signed the Memorandum on Tribal Consultation and Strengthening Nation-to-Nation -nation Relationships, in which he directed the head of each government agency to develop a detailed plan of action to implement Executive Order 13175, Consultation and Coordination with Indian Tribal Governments. This executive order calls for regular and meaningful consultation and collaboration with tribal officials in the development of federal policies that have tribal implications. Let me also recall that the United States respects the commitments made with regard to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2010, as we explained in our 2010 announcement of US support for the UN Declaration. In response to some of the legal arguments raised in this request, we would just like to point out at the outset that although the request invokes specific provisions of the American Declaration in some instances, it also suggests an expansion of the Commission's competence by invoking an array of other international instruments. As such, we reiterate our longstanding position that the non-binding American Declaration is the only relevant instrument which the Commission is competent to evaluate and apply in relation to the United States. Thank you, and I now turn to my colleague Joaquin Gallegos from the U.S. Department of the Interior to share his statement. Thank you, Interim uh, Permanent Representative. It's excellent to be with you all today. Um, my name is Joaquin Gallegos, and I serve as the Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the U.S. Department of the Interior, and I'm from the Hickory Apache Nation and the Pueblo of Santa Ana. As the effects of climate change continue to intensify, indigenous peoples are facing distinct climate-related challenges that pose existential threats to their economies, infrastructure, livelihoods, food supply, and health. Coastal indigenous peoples, especially in Alaska, are facing flooding, coastal erosion, permafrost subsidence, sea level rise, storm surges and extreme weather events. Inland indigenous peoples, especially in the contiguous 48 states, are facing worsening drought, extreme heat, wildland fire and flooding. As indigenous peoples contend with climate impacts, they face dis difficult decisions about their future. At the same time, the United States, through its special political and legal relationship with and trust responsibilities to Indian tribes, Alaska Native villages, and the Native Hawaiian community, seeks to strengthen climate resilience and adaptation, ocean and coastal management, community-driven relocation, and protect-in-place activities. The United States is demonstrating it takes its political and legal responsibilities to indigenous people seriously. A critical part of that is engaging in robust, interactive, pre-decisional, informative, and transparent government-to-government -government consultation with indigenous peoples when planning actions with tribal implications. It is the policy of the Department of the Interior to seek consensus with impacted tribes. We are at a critical juncture. A coordinated all of government approach is needed to address this crisis. First, the United States has affirmed its commitment 
to enhancing interagency coordination and collaboration to protect tribal treaty and reserved rights and to fully implement the federal government's treaty obligations. With transformational funding and cross-sectional expertise, the U.S. through the Interior Department is actively supporting collaborative and community-led planning, relocation financing, infrastructure investments and replacement, expanding access to clean drinking water, and other forms of assistance to Indigenous peoples. Through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the United States is providing $466 million to Indigenous peoples through the Interior Department, including $216 million for climate resilience programs and $250 million, $250 million to support water and health infrastructure. The law also includes a historic $2.5 billion investment to help fulfill settlements of Indian water rights claims and deliver long promised water resources to indigenous peoples, certainty to all their non-indigenous neighbors and a solid foundation for future economic development for entire communities dependent on common water resources in the face of climate change. And under the Inflation Reduction Act, the United States is taking the most aggressive action on climate and clean energy in American history, including by providing $272.5 million for Indian tribes and the Native Hawaiian community to plan for and adapt to climate change, mitigate drought, support fisheries, electrification, and to shift to clean energy production and use. This year, the Biden-Harris administration also established a community-driven relocation working group to address the need for tribal relocation and managed retreat assistance, through which the federal government will develop a blueprint for relocation that other communities can use as they implement their community's relocation. The key to its success is that it is a community-driven process in which tribal communities will lead the effort to develop plans that meet their community needs. The United States recognizes that Indigenous people's knowledge is needed to arrive at the solutions to the climate crisis. We work with Indigenous peoples to incorporate Indigenous traditional ecological knowledge into national efforts to address climate change and strengthen tribal co-stewardship of public lands and waters. The United States is also helping to bolster traditional indigenous food systems, including by restoring bison herds, safeguarding subsistence rights, protecting the porcupine caribou herd, which migrates between the United States and Canada, and reinforcing fisheries. From climate adaptation and the promise of clean energy to legacy pollution, cleanup and clean water infrastructure, the United States is making groundbreaking investments and strategizing in consultation with Indigenous peoples to help ensure they no longer bear the brunt of the climate crisis. The United States is ultimately committed to empowering Indigenous peoples as they face unique threats from climate change. Thank you for the time. I will now turn to my colleague from the Environmental Protection Agency. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Gallegos. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rafael De Leon, and I serve as the Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator for EPA's Office of International and Tribal Affairs. It is an honor to be here with you all today, and I appreciate the Coalition of Tribes presentation. EPA understands that Indigenous and Native American persons may be among the first to face the direct consequences of climate change, owing to their special and close relationship with the environment and its resources. EPA, along with the Department of Interior and our other federal partners are working across the government to address the impacts of climate change through a whole of government approach. I will provide some examples later in my presentation of some of the work that the agency is doing, along with the Department of Interior, 
and other federal partners under the White House Council for Native American Affairs. So first, I would want to highlight some of the agency's engagement with our tribal partners in Louisiana and Alaska. In Louisiana, EPA has been engaged in partnership with the Isle de Jean Charles Band of Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw Tribe regarding their relocation efforts. This engagement included in 2019, EPA, through its Healthy Places for Healthy People program, engaged with communities of the tribe to help them visualize an environmentally sustainable community design that prioritized access to healthy food and healthcare. Working with local colleges and universities, a partnership was forged between EPA's Office of Community Partnership, sorry, Community Revitalization, and EPA's College and Underserved Community Partnership Program that resulted in significant and lasting health outcomes for communities of the tribe. I'd like to point a few of those out. The outcomes established through this partnership include, one, providing Master of Public Health students to assist the tribe in archiving public health materials. Two, providing computer resources to tribe students and community members and providing the Biloxi Chickamauga Choctaw tribe with other technical assistance as needed. I would now like to speak briefly about some of the work that EPA is doing in Alaska. On October the 7th, the White House released a renewed national strategy for the Arctic region. This strategy identifies focus areas that directly intersects with EPA's mission, namely Pillar 2. The strategy is focused on climate change and environmental protection and says the following, the US government aims to partner with Alaskan communities and the state of Alaska to build resilience to the impacts of climate change while working to reduce emissions from the Arctic as part of broader global mitigation efforts to improve scientific understanding and to conserve Arctic ecosystems. A key strategic priority is to address the climate crisis with urgency and new investments in sustainable development to improve livelihoods for Arctic residents while conserving the environment. Accordingly, EPA strives to engage with tribal governments and organizations, including Alaska Native Villages, through existing programs that the tribal governments and organizations are eligible to apply to, such as the Environmental Justice Collaborative Problem Solving Agreement Program. In addition, EPA continues to evaluate how our existing authorities and resources can be used to expand our efforts to address contaminated ANSCA lands. Congress has also included in the draft FY23 budget two large earmarks, 7 million for Alaska to do inventory work and 11 million for grants to native villages and corporations for work related to the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. In addition to our work in Louisiana and Alaska, second, I want to discuss several other EPA initiatives that can help our tribal partners build resilience to climate change. EPA is striving to develop centers around the nation to provide technical assistance to tribal nations and indigenous communities among others. These centers will provide grant writing assistance and other support to communities that may not have had past success applying for and managing federal funding including support for accessing clean, affordable energy, for analyzing community environmental burdens, and more. In addition, EPA, along with the Department of Interior, co-chairs the White House Council on Native American Affairs, Climate Change, Tribal Homelands, and Treaties Committee. The EPA, along with the Department of Interior and the Department of State, also co-chairs the International Indigenous Issues Committee. Through EPA's work on the Climate Change, Tribal Homelands, and Treaties Committee, 
EPA is coordinating with multiple federal agencies to develop a year long climate webinar series, which we expect to kick off in January of 2023. <clears throat> this series is designed to educate federal employees on tribal and indigenous climate change considerations. We have heard from our tribal partners the importance of federal employees being educated on issues impacting them. This effort and other initiatives are designed to address the feedback we have received. Also, the subcommittee will be developing a federal resources guide as a resource for tribal partners on the types of funding available from federal agencies to address climate change. Taken together, EPA is using lessons learned in the domestic context on climate change and adaptation to inform the work being conducted as part of the International Indigenous Issues Committee under the White House Council on Native American Affairs. In closing, EPA recognizes the importance of engaging with tribal nations and indigenous communities and aims to build on our existing engagement with tribal partners. My office is looking forward to working in partnership with EPA's new Office of Environmental Justice and external civil rights to develop strategies and approaches to engage with our tribal partners, including state recognized tribes. We extend the invitation to meet on today's call. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. And I turn it back over to uh, the chair. Thank you very much um, for your submissions um, to us and information you have given to us. Um, I now um, have the pleasure of inviting the members of the um, commission to make their interventions. And I call on um, my sister, Commissioner Esmeralda de Tartino to make her interventions. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Madam President and Chair of this hearing, I would like to especially greet good morning, good afternoon for others. I would like to recognize first civil society organizations and the representatives of the indigenous communities and tribal peoples who today share their experiences. And I also would like to greet the honorable representation of the state for the information that we have been provided with today. The issue of the climate crisis. This is how we address this through our special rapporteurship on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. We are not talking about climate change, but about the climate crisis, because we understand that there are many aspects that, for example, today we are talking about the impacts on indigenous communities. We are really concerned about this. I'd like to know what both parties think, both the representatives of the indigenous communities and what the state thinks about the following. We have heard several statements, and so far we see that, that their autonomy is not recognized by the state. They are excluded in some of the responses and initiatives. There is a need to receive support and funding because of the forced displacement that they have faced as a result of the serious climate crisis. This includes hurricanes, global warming, all these elements that you have mentioned. The state at the same time indicated that they are taking a series of actions aimed at providing information, provide technical assistance, programs 
to promote resilience, to promote investment. After listening to both parties, I would like to know what is lacking, what is missing, so that tribal and indigenous communities, sometimes some of them are not being recognized. Um, and the state mentioned this. So I would like to know what is lacking to address the request and then demands made by tribal and indigenous peoples today. So that these plans, these programs, all these actions that the state is taking I truly appreciate what the state is doing. I think it's very positive. Maybe what's missing is to have better communication and to promote closer links between the two parties. So I'd like to know what is missing to close the gap in terms of resources, in terms of responses, in terms of protection, taking into consideration the demands of the tribal and indigenous peoples. And to conclude, I think that Joaquin was talking about this. He was talking about recognizing treaties, UN treaties, and in those treaties, we have the recognition of the right to self-determination. But the representatives of the state are saying that they follow those principles mentioned in these treaties. So, I'd like to know what measures that should be taken into consideration for the full recognition of this community so that these communities are fully recognized so that they have the opportunity to have a relationship with the state to find support and to access these programs that the state mentioned today, if there is no prior free consent or prior consultation, if you do not communicate with indigenous peoples, it is not possible for these programs to reach all the communities. And we need them to reach all the communities, especially all those who are demanding the support to face the impacts of the climate crisis that they are facing. So that's all on my side. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you so much, um, um, es Esmeralda. Um, I, uh, uh, Commissioner Hernandez, do you wish to intervene? Muy, muy brevemente, Presidenta, muy brevemente. Very briefly, Mrs. President, um, it's not that much that I can contribute to this debate and the colleague and the special rapporteur, they have more expertise, but yes, uh, it caught my attention, uh, the topics that were submitted in this hearing, I guess this is a unique hearing in the commission period of sessions, if I'm not wrong, is one of the first of the few odd, um, hearings that the commission has taken into account the problems arisen by the climate change for these communities, and in this case, indigenous communities. The climate crisis to what the commissioner mentioned has already caught us this week in a report from the United Nations uh, towards the preparation of COP27 they are already 
envisioning what is unavoidable, which is the heating of the earth by the end of the century, two or three more Celsius degrees than expected before. And of course, this has devastating consequences. I commemorate um, the commitment expressed here by the US agencies. We know this is not easy. It is not in the US and it is not nowhere else. This is uh, such a politic problem, even partisan uh, problems. This is uh, far from the realities of the communities. This is uh, mainly an economic problem where economic factors have such a huge impact in order to take actions to face climate change. So within these difficulties, the commitments that we heard here in the Ministry of Interior and the Environmental Protection Agency, I believe that they are sensibilized about the impact that climate change has. I also uh, welcome that there's an approach towards the indigenous peoples, that there's a tribal approach, that there's a unity within the ministry specifically devoted to satisfy the needs of the indigenous peoples, because as it was already mentioned, only the indigenous uh, peoples and the tribal uh, peoples are the ones that have the greatest impact on climate change because of their direct con um, contact with natural resources and the earth. I will leave a question. Um, I would like to know how the federal agencies work with the indigenous people's uh, queries with the idea to design mitigation plans, but also adaptation plans. I also know that in the United States, the political scheme is complex because there could be federal and state uh, competences. But since we have representatives of federal agencies in this hearing, I would like to know how this queries uh, or consultations uh, will advance, especially for the indigenous communities. Thank you for the opportunity, Mrs. President. Thank you, um, Commissioner. I'm now happy to invite um, the Rapporteur um, of this United, for the United States, um, Commissioner Roberta Clark, to intervene. Thank you very much. And I want to join my fellow commissioners in saying good morning to everyone, representatives of the indigenous people's communities, as well as representatives of the state. Um, a, a very informative session and one in which I personally identify with. I myself come from a small island development state. I'm, I'm based in the Caribbean and we too are feeling the impacts of climate change and as corrected by Commissioner Arosemena, climate crisis, because I think that's where we are and all the changes already occurred. I, I, I very much uh, understand the representatives of the indigenous people's community to talk, when they speak about early and disproportionate, negatively disproportionate impacts of the climate crisis on indigenous communities for a variety of reasons. Um, some of those reasons relate to location and geography, just where communities are, are, are settled and have been settled traditionally on the coast and in Alaska. On, uh, I think that's a small island from what I can understand or an island from what I can understand. But also um, the historical marginalization experienced by indigenous peoples um, in the United States. And that marginalization has created an ongoing crisis of inequality. Um, failure, I understand from the representatives here of Indigenous communities, failure to recognize uh, some communities and the impacts of that failure has had on self-determination. The underinvestment of the state and the federal government, they are alleging in adaptation and mitigation strategies to address the climate change, which has led to loss of land, um, increasing, of course, ferocity, frequency and ferocity of storms, um, we're even hearing about droughts or, and, and, and flooding, which of course is also 
uh, something that's uh, a, a feature of climate crisis. On the other hand, from the representatives of the of the state, um, um, and I want to recognize uh, Mr. Hastings, um, Mr. Delio, and um, Mr. Galigos, we hear a range, a commitment, first of all, uh, a commitment to addressing the redressing and repairing the harms done to indigenous peoples. And we also hear a commitment to responding very proactively to the climate crisis. And uh, a number of initiatives have been spoken about. And also, um, we've had a lot of indication of, of financial resources going to indigenous peoples' communities to do that adaptation and that mitigation. But I want to maybe ask the state representatives to maybe when they get a chance to speak again, to focus very specifically on what we have heard today from the very specific communities that we've heard today. And they have spoken of failure to recognize um, their legal status as indigenous people. So I, I, the first question would be, what, uh, what is the status of that recognition? What are the impediments to recognizing? Um, that's the first question. And then we've also heard uh, at least two of these communities say, in the context of what I understand Mr. Gallegos have said, he said that the government is committed to community-driven relocation, but these communities have already said that they've identified where they, that they have to leave, the, the community in Alaska, please forgive me for not um, recalling the name of the community, but they said very clearly way back in the 20th century, they knew that they were in a place of risk and that they would have to be relocated and notwithstanding recommendations for specific sites for relocation, they have not been able to, to get that done. So again, in relation to those specific uh, concerns, if we can get specific requests, uh, responses to those, to, to, those, um, to those issues that have been raised. Um, and also the failure of recognition also means that the, the resources that are coming through the federal government are not accessible to indigenous people communities that are, who are here. Is there a response that the state can give to that? Um, Elder Chief Sorel uh, Parfait Dardar, you spoke in general terms about, um, I just want to get it right, the, the problem with the, the extraction, the extractive industries are uh, given access to lands without full and, and informed consent uh, or even consultation with the indigenous people's communities. And then you also spoke about discriminatory practices that are burdensome and costly, but you didn't tell us what those discriminatory practices are. So my specific request of you is to maybe amplify what do you mean by that to give us some guidance. Thank you very much. It's a very difficult issue. I know it's a, a global issue and we have to address it. The time is now. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I'm now happy to invite the special rapporteur who has the burden of monitoring and watching and helping in relation to environmental issues. Soledad Monels Garcia, please intervene. Uh, thank you, Madam President of the... I will speak in Spanish. I welcome the delegates of the United States and the distinguished representatives of the Shan uh, community, the Bloxi, Chitimacha, uh, Choctaw Nation, and for their testimony. I would like to offer first and foremost my deeply solidarity and empathy toward the harsh situation that you have uh, related uh, that you are commented to us today and also taking into account the climate crisis but also because of the consequence of the historic discrimination that the indigenous peoples have suffered as a special rapporteur I work for the International Commission of Human Rights, and this hearing is at a specific moment. A few weeks before the start of the new round of climate negotiations that takes place in Egypt, and also it's a privilege to my office to be present in this hearing and to hear the situation of indigenous communities that are in the front row of climate change. I will also like to thank 
the representatives of the state of the United States of America because of their presence here and the bona fide and the commitment that they showed in their interventions and also the importance that means to acknowledge the competence of the inter-American system in this area, which is one of the most or the most important that we have for humankind in terms of rights. I will also like to express that this topic is a utmost priority for the mandate that I have in the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And because of this, we have been developing new standards to offer the states and the civil society in the Americas, different tools to manage the impact of climate change on human rights. So I would like to stress how by the end of December of 2021, the Inter-American Commission adopted unanimously a resolution which is unique in their uh, class, which is the 2021 resolution about the climate emergency in human rights. We are facing a real emergency. Your testimony leaves this so clear as well. This resolution Give us, uh, gives us the base to continue to work to the prevention of climate change, taking into account human rights. And this is what we are requesting the American states in general. And now to the United States of America in particular, you need to take into account these standards, put the center of all your actions or put the climate crisis as the center of all your actions as well as intersex and gender equality. I will also like to call the attention uh, of you because the climate crisis also affects a great diversity of human rights, such as health, education, uh, homeland, life, integrity, and not only to the people who nowadays lives in this planet, but it also sets a risk for the for those who will come after us for future generations. So it caught my attention because the special protection that the indigenous peoples deserve, and I would like to refer specifically to the resolution, not only to those who know the indigenous peoples as victims of uh, human rights violations within the climate crisis, but as the great protagonists of the protection of nature and the conservation of land, they should have a vital role in the in the public policies that the states adopt in terms of climate crisis. I would like to express not only the importance of this hearing as the commissioner Hernandez and the commissioners uh, before him also expressed this is a unique hearing in climate in the climate crisis and the human rights uh, um, uh, topics and also the situation of the indigenous peoples and the original peoples in the americans in the americas and all the uh, indigenous peoples in the whole american country so i would like to ask the state and the social uh, the civil society what do you think we can do from the commission in order to help these measures to be more effective and another uh, question is how these affected peoples because of the forced displacement can access these resources that come from the state and that was not informed before. Finally, a general mention that I really expect to see the United States of America as a leader in the climate uh, mission in the next COP and also to have a human rights based approach in this area because this is for all of us. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Special Rapporteur. Um, the Commission has overshot its time by 2.6 minutes. <laughs> so 
Um, I will I will use my closing statement to say what I wanted to say. Um, now we call on the uh, civil society again to speak, and civil society will have twelve minutes and thirty seconds for your closing comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Patty Ferguson Bonney. I'm a member of the Pornchant Indian Tribe, and I'm also the director of the Indian Legal Clinic at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. What I think I might start out with is explain the difference between federally recognized tribes and non-recognized tribes and the problem with obtaining recognition and how it impacts many of the rights of the four tribes who are part of this, um, this petition. Um, so basically, according to Congress, recognized is more than a simple adjective, it's a legal term of art. And federal acknowledgement or recognition refers to the formal political act of affirming a tribe's legal status as an independent political community and institutionalizes the government to government relationship between the federal government and the tribe. So if you have federal tribes, then you have non-federal tribes. And then non-federal tribes, um, there have been reports done um, that show that the process to obtain recognition is time intensive, expensive, burdensome, and not transparent. And these reports were done by the GAO, the Government Accountability Office. And there are tribes who have sought recognition, who've been in the process for decades, some 30 years, spending $33 million. Um, the federal recognition process was created in 1978 because there was a need to recognize tribes and there were tribes that weren't recognized. It was supposed to be a short process, taking a year or more, but we know now that it takes many decades and the tribes that are before you don't have the resources uh, that are required to set forth their petitions. And there hasn't been a, a lot of historical research about the tribes that is accurate. Um, and I think Chief Sherelle Parfait Dardar mentioned that the tribes in South Louisiana were discriminated against, that we were not allowed to attend high school until the late 1960s. Therefore, we have many people in our community who don't have education. As Chief uh, Dardar introduced himself in Indian French, that is the primary language of our people. And we do not have high levels of education from our communities. Um, but whenever people started to go to school in the late 1960s, they were discriminated against and punished for speaking Indian French. And so it has been a long struggle to try to educate our people. There are other two other ways to become recognized that was uh, identified by the U.S. government in, the, uh, in 1994, which includes being recognized through Congress. And you have to have congressional support from your home state senators for that, and then also through the courts. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because if you're not fairly recognized, then many of the programs that were mentioned are not accessible to our tribes. And there has not been consultation or coordination with our tribes with regards to what is happening. So specifically, I wanna mention that the situation that we're in um, we have been put in this position due to decisions made by government officials. First, which was the levying off of the Mississippi River, which prevents the freshwater flow. So it cuts off life. And whenever, um, you know, before more land would be made. So now that's been cut off. And basically because the extractive industries have come in, they have been cut a lot of the land up which brings in salt water. So in the picture behind me, you can see dead trees. And as Chairman Dardar mentioned, this was a very small uh, canal and now it's over 400 feet. And so it's brought in salt water and it's killed the life ways there and people can no longer live there. And we have many cemeteries and burial mounds that are threatened from these decisions to allow unlimited oil and gas extraction in our Aboriginal lands um, without any input from us. And we have requested from the state of Louisiana 
that they provide us notice when they issue coastal permits and they will not respond to us with regards to that. Um, I also want to mention that with the other thing that was asked with regards to other discriminatory issues and how we're impacted, assistance users who, because of the lack of education, land was taken away um, because people couldn't read or write English. And so now there are paper title holders who try to exclude our people from using our lands and waters for fishing, hunting, and trapping. And sometimes they get arrested. Sometimes they get citations for, um, for using these lands. And so that should not happen. We should not be, be denied our subsistence ways of life because of this. Um, I also want to mention that after the BP oil spill, that we were washed up on shore and we were excluded from even knowing about that because we are not federally recognized. The federal government would only consult with federal tribes who were not from our area and did not have that same relationship. So that is a high level of discrimination. And of course that's being exasperated now by sea level rise um, and by climate impacts. The other thing, um, that I wanted to mention real briefly because uh, I think it's important to note is that the Morganza to the Gulf levee system, which uh, Chief Albert spoke about, is a hurricane protection system for Terrebonne and Lafourche parishes. So everything within the levee system should be protected. So the area that you see behind us, which is our Admiral lands, are not included in that area, and it includes um, it includes burial mounds, hunting and fishing villages, that is excluded. And they did not consult with any of our tribes when they developed the alignment of that. And they could have included Chief Albert and John Charles, Il John Charles in that, but they did not do that. And then they did not allocate any funds for the resettlement of Il de Jean Charles. Um, Mr. Albert and the tribe itself tried to incorporate a community-led resettlement, which had basically been hijacked by the state government under the guise that they could not deal, only have this resettlement for a tribe because we're not federally recognized that it would violate the laws of the United States because it would be discriminatory and violate equal protection because we are, not, we are seen as a race and not as a don't have any political status. So I think those are very important points to note. I also want to note that the US government has known about the erosion in both Louisiana and Alaska for quite some time. Um, in 2007, the Government Accountability Office published a report entirely focused on Louisiana's coastal erosion examining wetland loss and efforts to restore and protect coastal wetlands. In 2020, the GAO updated the report, assessing climate resilience on the Alaska and Louisiana coast, and concluding that the U.S. needs a federal climate mitigation program. Again, these programs what, that have been mentioned, the money that has been mentioned with regards to doing climate mitigation and adaptation for tribes, does not include the Louisiana tribe. There have been no um, direct communication or consultation with the tribes on these issues. Um, um, I also want to note that the current administration has recognized that federal land leases contribute to the climate, climate crisis, but they continue to grant leases to corporations for oil and gas extraction and approximately 25% of the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions come from these fossil fuel extractions on public land. And that the Inflation Reduction Act uh, promises funding for programs related to climate resiliency and adaptation, but the tribal specific provisions exclude Louisiana tribes, our Louisiana tribes, which the federal government has refused to recognize as tribes. Our tribes have been in the process for almost three decades. Um, and it does not do as much to incentivize, incentivize climate change as it does to treat its symptoms. For instance, the act expressly incentivizes oil and gas leasing on federal land, offshore drilling, 
which contributes to climate change. I wanna take a minute to talk about um, also Kivalina um, and just note that the state of Alaska and US government have repeatedly failed to protect the right to self-determination of the tribe by not implementing their decisions that they have made, the tribe itself, and failing to complete the protective rock revetment and the failure thus far to facilitate the tribal government's relocation plans. Without the funding and technical resources to relocate, the community continues to live without safe drinking water and sanitation, and now it's overcrowded due to its decreased livable space. We, the petitioners, which include our five tribes, make the following request to the commission. We would like you to facilitate interactions between the petitioners and the government delegation, including representatives from the Department of State, Department of Justice, Department of Interior, Interior the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and representatives from the states of Alaska and Louisiana. Um, also recognize that the climate force displacement is a human rights crisis and conduct an in loco visit to the tribal nations of the petitioners. We'd also request that, um, that there is a visit from the special rapporteur on economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. And we would like a comprehensive report or resolution on climate faith force displacement and the obligations of states to provide indigenous and other vulnerable communities protection and mitigation from the effects of climate change. We'd also request relevant information be obtained from the US government on its human rights compliance under Article 18 of the Statute of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And we make the following recommendations to the US government. To immediately provide federal aid directly to the tribes named in this petition to rebuild and bolster the protection of their homes, ancestral lands, and traditional sites, including our burial sites and sacred sites, from pending storms and the ongoing impacts of the climate crisis. To recognize our self-determination and inherent sovereignty of all the Louisiana tribes, including those federally recognized tribes in Alaska and those who have not received federal recognition at all and all relevant government policies related to addressing climate change and disaster aid. And to also work with us to grant federal recognition to the tribal nations in Louisiana, so we're able to access these federal resources and recognize our collective rights to the land, subsistence, and cultural identities, and our collective right to return to and maintain access to our ancestral homelands. Finally, we would like you to develop the federal re relocation institutional framework that's based in human rights protections to adequately respond to the threats facing tribal nations, including the rapid provision of resources for adaptation efforts that protect the right to culture, health, safe drinking water, food, and adequate housing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Patty Ferguson. Um, I would now invite the states to make their final comments. And um, you will have 14 minutes and 45 seconds. But... Thank you. Beyond Indian specific funding and groundbreaking initiatives, the United States is committed to advancing environmental justice and making sure that no communities are left behind. For the first time in U.S. history, the federal government has made it a goal that 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. From climate adaptation and the promise of clean energy to legacy pollution cleanup and clean water infrastructure, it's important that federal investments benefit communities who for too long have borne the brunt of the climate crisis. As mentioned, the U.S. maintains a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with federally recognized Indian tribes as political entities and is fully committed to strengthening that relationship in a coordinated In 2015, the Interior Department updated the federal acknowledgement regulations at Part 83 and looks forward to consulting with tribes on this issue. 
We know that Indigenous peoples may not have the resources or technical assistance required to face the changing climate. These issues are too a new concept for the federal government and it takes time to develop processes with each agency having its own jurisdiction and processes. Under the bipartisan infrastructure law, $130 million are provided for community relocation. 86 million is provided for tribal climate resilience and adaptation projects, and 43.2 million are available to further similar initiatives. And 250 million is being used to support construction, repair, improvement and maintenance on irrigation and power systems, safety of dams, and public health and safety compliance issues at water sanitation systems. To see the first-hand effects of these issues, Assistant Secretary Brylin Newland recently this year went to the native village of Cavalina to see the impacts firsthand. Additionally, the newly reconstituted White House Arctic Executive Steering Committee is reinvigorating its community resilience work group which seeks to address the issues faced by at-risk communities, including on the Alaskan coast. To help Indigenous peoples to remain safe and secure in their homelands, the United States is supporting infrastructure development, the basic physical and cultural structures and facilities needed for a functioning society. These infrastructure needs include physical infrastructure, cultural infrastructure, and, and em empowering Indigenous peoples to live in safe environmental conditions. Ultimately, the United States is determined to empower Indigenous peoples and support them as they face the unique challenges of climate change. Thank you for the time. At this uh, moment, I will turn to my colleague, PDAA DeLeo at the EPA for further comments. Thank you, Joaquin. And I want to thank the members of the civil society again for their comments. I want to address the comment about climate change and consultation and engagement with tribal partners. EPA's major offices, including the Office of Air, Water and Pesticides, and my office, the Office of International and Tribal Affairs, have each developed a climate adaptation implementation plan. These plans describe how each program and region at EPA will integrate climate adaptation into its programs, policies, and operations to enable EPA to achieve its mission, even under changing climate conditions. They also describe how each EPA office will partner with states, tribes, territories, local governments, and communities of all sizes to strengthen their ability to anticipate, prepare for, adapt to, and recover from the impacts of climate change. Particular attention is given to those actions that deliver co-benefits, including curbing greenhouse gas emissions and other pollution, and promoting public health, economic growth, and climate justice. In a number of cases, our national programs and regional offices have engaged with tribal governments to better understand the impacts of climate change in Indian country. Taken together, the 20 or so implementation plans reflected across EPA provide a roadmap for the specific actions EPA will take over the next four years with other federal agencies and its partners across the nation to continue to protect human health and the environment under future climate conditions, with a particular focus on advancing environmental justice. Thank you again, and I turn it now back to Mr. Hastings. Thanks very much, Rafael. Thank you, Joaquin. Uh, thank you to all who participated today. This concludes the US government's uh, portion and contribution to the conversation, uh, but I'd like to again thank all who participated from tribal nations today, uh, members of the commission, 
And also, of course, I see that we have some 50 plus uh, attendees who are not registered as speakers, but who are also tuned in to take part in this. And of course, this hearing becomes a matter of public record. So in the future, people will be able to uh, view this and engage on these issues. Uh, it seems clear to me that we have sort of identified two separate topics in a way which are linked and both important. Uh, there's the issue of the climate crisis and its impact on humans anywhere in the United States globally, something that we're going to have to be continuing to work on for decades to come. And there's the much more specific question of federally recognized tribes uh, versus groups that do not have that distinction. Uh, and I understand that's extremely important for several of the tribes that are recognized, that are represented on this call here today and that specific question of recognition. I divide that up not to uh, make any judgment on one issue or the other, but simply to point out that I think a lot of what we ended up talking about today sort of came down to that distinction in addition to a larger issue of the climate crisis. And we look forward to talking about these issues further in the future. Um, again, the United States is committed to empowering indigenous people as they face unique threats and uniquely severe threats from the crisis, cli climate crisis. We definitely recognize that a whole of government approach is necessary to address these issues. Uh, and so again, I'm, I thank my colleagues from our Ministry of Environment, our Ministry of Interior, uh, myself from the Ministry of, of the Department of State or Foreign Relations and our interactions with the OAS and the Inter-American Inter Commission on Human Rights for convening us today and uh, providing a platform for these important conversations. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. It falls to me to um, express the thanks of the commission and myself to both civil society for your very, very insightful and, and um, full of, of specific facts and examples of what you, you have been speaking about, the climate crisis and the lack of recognition um, by uh, the federal government and state recognition, I understand as well, of so many communities. I, I, in relation to that, uh, it behoves me to, to um, request from the state a written reporting answer in relation to the process of the uh, um, recognition, both at federal level and at state level, of the communities of what I prefer to call the first peoples of um, the, uh, the United, United States territory. And, and also um, the law, uh, an opinion as to the law and why it is it taking so long, be, the, despite the interest of the, the state to assist these communities and to ensure their self-sufficiency and their self-determination. Uh, we would, this is very important for the commission to understand and appreciate. And secondly, um, we would, I, I know my sister Esmeralda has been considering this matter, be um, sending an official request for the commission to visit these areas to see for itself. Um, what these, these peoples are experiencing. Uh, because around the world, um, tribal communities, indigenous communities, Afro-descendant communities, the poor are the ones who have the least footprint and suffer the greatest uh, um, crisis from climate change, which is committed by the industrialized state in pursuing industrialized profits rather than interest in the lives because it affects their lives and their healthy life and self-sustaining life of peoples who were and are the ancestors. Uh, their ancestors were the first occupiers of the region. I think, I think we would need more specific answers in relation to, to that. And you, we would be sending a request um, to visit these areas. I thank all of you. I thank the state for its open, open uh, presentations. I thank civil society again for being here with us. And I thank all those who are listening. With that, goodbye. Thank you. And I thank my colleagues, of course.
<laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Good, good day. Saludos. Gracias a todos.